So, this is the beginning of Deep Dive Sunday School. What that means is that we're doing Sunday School. We're doing the same lessons that kids in Sunday School do, but taking a deeper dive into them, seeing not only the basic things that happened, but also looking for those ways in which these events and God's words and actions in them shape our faith and point us to Christ and point us to other events and things in the New Testament. So before we begin, just some general overview questions. How many stories are there in the Bible? And by the way, I do not object to the term story. Story does not automatically mean fable. A story can also mean the account, kind of like how the story of when you were born. A story means something that is told to someone. So how many stories are, in the, are there in the Bible? Do you know? A lot. I don't actually know the answer for how many small stories there are in the Bible. But when you think about it, there's actually only one story in the Bible. The Bible is the story of God revealing his salvation to the world in Christ. Every small story that we see in the Bible, every small story that we study during this Bible class, that is part of the greater story of God showing himself to us and saving to us, saving us in Christ. But the next question is, if we are not part of Old Testament Israel, what do these things have to do with us? Can one of you look up and read Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9? I got it. Go ahead. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentile by faith preaching the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. So does it matter if you are not genetically an Israelite? No. By grafting you into his family of faith, God has grafted you into this history. So that even though you were not present for these things, neither you nor your literal biological ancestors, this is your history because this is the history of God saving you, right? <coughs> now, <coughs> looking more specifically at the account of the creation, what are the two reasons why the creation account in Genesis has become so under attack in modern times. One might seem obvious, but one might not seem so obvious. Why do so many people in the world reject to the notion that God created the world and the universe and everything on it, or at least the potential for everything on it, in six 24-hour days? It's because of science, quite basically, right? But there's another reason why people object to the creation account, and that is because of the ramifications this account has on their conscience. And we'll talk about those first. If there is no God, and if everything in the world came about by random chance, then that means there is no divine power to whom you are morally accountable. It means that you can essentially do and say and think whatever you want, as long as the laws of society don't put you in jail or punish you for those things. Because if there is no God, and if everything evolved by random chance, then whatever the most highly evolved creature on earth is, that is the alpha species. And that would be us, right? We're the ones who have reason and intellect. We're the ones who have opposable thumbs so that we can build hammers and buildings and all those kinds of things. But what if there is a God? If there is a God who made everything and who has given you your conscience, then that means 
that there is a God to whom you are morally accountable, who has the right to tell you how you are supposed to live your life. Kind of like how if you go to play basketball at someone's house and they own the court, they own the ball, they pay the electric bill that turns the lights on and off, well, guess who gets to decide what game you're playing? The host, unless that person opens it up for discussion. So whether or not the world was made by God or evolved definitely impacts how we view ourselves morally and what sort of moral accountability we live our lives under. Yes? So, um, I, sorry if I'm going off on a tangent, but what would be the best way to respond to someone who says, well, actually, the reverse is true. If you believe in God, you can do whatever you want as long as you repent, so to speak, and it's all good, you know, as long as you believe the right things. So cheap grace? Yeah. Like, and I would just say that's not, that's not the relationship with God that the Bible presents. That it is that we are not brought into a faith and a relationship with God where we are allowed to consciously sin, thinking, well, I'll repent later and then God will have to forgive me because that's not how forgiveness works because that's not how repentance works. God forgives those who come to him regretting their sins and wishing they had not done them and desiring for God's absolution for the sake of Christ. God does not forgive the sins of those who come to him saying, you have to forgive me because Jesus says you do. Because that's not what you are and that's not what God is. So my response would be that is simply God is not mocked, is that you're not allowed to tell God what he has to do. You're allowed to ask God to be merciful to you. And there's a very big difference. Even though God has told us that we can be confident of his mercy and that we don't need to be afraid of coming to him in repentance and faith, you should be quite afraid of coming before God saying, you... I knew I was going to do this, and I knew you had to forgive me, so now let's go through the motion of doing this. That sounds like discipline that you would go through in public school, but that's not what happens in the Christian church. But now let's get to the first reason of science. Science is not able to measure God. Science is only able to measure what is put in front of it. So. So can, can science measure how many people are in this room right now? Yes or no? Yes. yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, so on and so forth. Can science measure how many angels are in this room? No. Science can only measure what it sees. So we would not expect science operating outside of the constraints of scripture and doctrine to tell us that the world was created exactly as the book of Genesis says. We also need to remember that if God was going to create the world in a way that was livable for plants and animals and people right away, he was going to have to create it with the illusion of age, right? Because we would normally see that the layers, you know, the layers of the earth, for example, would would get built up and occur, you could say, over the course of many years. And we would see things like an atmosphere developing over, you know, a, a, a mass happening over many years. But we know that when God made plants and animals, that they didn't die. They weren't sucked out into the void of space right away when he made them. And he said, oops, I have to, I have to fix this first. Is that God made the, the world in a way that would have looked older than it actually was just because he had to, so that what he put on it could really be good and stay alive and do what it was supposed to do. But we do realize that there, you know, getting back to kind of the spiritual aspects of creation and the theory of evolution, is that 
the, the theory of macroevolution, big evolution, not, not adaptation that we see happening within races and with, within species, the odds of that being able to happen are very minute. But if the alternative to that which is unlikely, to put it lightly, is that you are morally accountable to a God who cannot be seen and who has, told, and who has revealed himself to you in the Bible, well then a lot of people will desire to believe in the unlikely because then it allows them to be at the top of the intellectual and moral food chain as opposed to submitting to a higher divine power whom we are not allowed to boss around in anything. Make sense? Any questions, comments? What's interesting is... How about Denise first? Oh, you okay, guys so started at the same time. Um, <laughs> we could tie. Um, I, you know how scientists or, or whoever will say, you know, so many billions of years ago on Earth, well, the Earth isn't that old, right? Correct. It's, it's, you go back in the Bible to what the Bible says. The Earth's it's, age can be measured in four or five figures. Anything more than that? The way, the way to understand the age of the earth is like a rubber band. That there are some people who hold to the, the, the shortest possible length of time. And usually that means that the, um, oh, why am I skipping the word? The genealogies given in the Bible, especially in Genesis, are one generation after another. Boom, 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 without any gaps. But we also know that there's the possibility that those things are given kind of as highlights. Kind of like in our history books, we don't say every single generation we give the highlights. But still, that being said, the age of the Earth is kind of like a rubber band. It can be unstretched, or it can be stretched a little bit within the confines of the Bible. If you pull it too hard, it snaps. So for people who say that things happened millions or billions of years ago, they're simply operating on the basis of what they think they see, but purging from the possibility, the idea that there is a God who created anything with the illusion of age, or purging from the possibility that the conditions of the earth have always been as they are now. Because we are given pretty clear indications that life on earth was different after the flood than before the flood. And we'll talk about some of those things today. I mean, because think about, think about the, the disaster of a worldwide flood and the sort of tectonic activity that God would have needed to affect to cause the waters to cover the earth and then cause the earth, dry land, to rise up out of the waters. It's not like the water just got sucked into the planet's core and went nowhere. The way that you can make dry land rise out of water is by increasing the severity of altitude differences between the ocean floor and what is dry. And so thinking about fossils, for example, that sort of extreme severe tectonic activity can produce pressure which would then give the impression of a much longer period of time than there actually was. Answer your question-ish. All right, let's get in then to Genesis chapter 1. We'll take turns reading some of these verses. So, oh, Mary, you had a question, right? Yeah, but I, I lost it. It might come back to It me. must have been super important. <laughs> well, then you can begin reading Genesis 1, 1 through 5, please. Sorry, I'm still stuck in Galatians. Sorry. <laughs> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Audrey, are you looking at Genesis 1? Can you read verses 6 through 8, please? And God 
I said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and it separated the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Thank you. I'll mention this now, Denise, because I had planned on bringing it up later in our discussion, that that is one example of the living conditions of the earth being different pre-flood versus post-flood. Because the verses Audrey just read, they pretty much tell us that there was a celestial reservoir of water that was either in the form of very thick clouds or even condensed water that would have existed in the atmosphere. And that would have had the effect of shielding the earth and its people from the harmful rays of the sun, thus making much, much longer lifespans possible, for one thing. Because after the flood, we see lifespans going from hundreds of years down to like a hundred and change, which is like normal for us nowadays, right? Um, and that would also explain why for the earth to be dry before the flood would take less um, mountains and hills than it would take after for that second chunk of water, which we'll study in a few weeks or even in two weeks. When it came down, it made higher peaks and valleys necessary in order for there to still be dry land on the earth. And now can you read verses 9 through 13? Thank you. And I'll read the next chunk of verses. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And then, Mary, could you also read verses 24 and 25? 24 and 25. And God said, let the earth... Oh, no, I skipped something. I'm sorry. 20 through 23. And you're so good at reading, why don't you also read 24 and 25, please? Oh, why not? Because no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Thank you. So... <laughs> we'll stop and review now before we keep going. Who is making everything? God. God, specifically. Is it just one person? No. Trinity. The Trinity. Where do we see the Trinity in the creation account? 
What? Well, that's part of it. But have we heard that yet? We haven't heard that yet. But you are right. Your heart's in the right place, Marta. Um, Audrey, can you read Genesis 1, verse 2 again, please? And then, Denise, while she's doing that, why don't you pull John 1 up in your phone? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was without form, void, and darkness over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was covering over the face of the waters. So, who was hovering over the face of the waters? The Holy Spirit was. And then, Denise, are you in John 1 yet? I think so. Can you read verses 1 through 3 and then verse 14, please? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. The Word became flesh his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So who is that? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So, God the Father is most explicitly present in the Genesis creation account. But we are told the Holy Spirit was also present, hovering over the waters. And we are told that nothing that was made was made without the eternal Son, also known as the Word of God. We see the Word of God clearly. Whenever God said, let there be, so on and so forth, that is where we see Jesus in the creation account before he was conceived and born and given the name Jesus. So it is the triune God who is doing these things. And how is everything being made? Speaking. I kind of answered my own question. God is not yet using anything. He's not using any raw substance, even something he has made, to create anything that we are told about. And it is interesting that so much of this is focused in only on Earth. Only a passing reference is made to the universe. Because when we're told that God made the stars in the sky, the earth and the moon, that is the reference to when God was making everything not on this planet. And what else was God making when we are told he was making the stars in the sky? Angels. Angels, yes. You know, when I was, hot, when I was teaching this at Prince of Peace this week, I was very pleasantly surprised that one of the kids right away had that answer. And that's why one of the very oldest hymns that we sing on the festival of St. Michael and All Angels is Stars of the Morning, which was written in like the 300s. And usually if there's a hymn written in the 300s, it's good to sing because Christians have been singing that for a long time. So Lucifer quickly was defeated, right? If he was yeah. created in a... We're going to get into that more um, next week. But yes, the fall into sin in heaven, so the celestial rebellion of Lucifer into which he was able to draw about a third of the angels, that happened before Genesis chapter 3 and after the end of Genesis chapter 2. Because when God says everything is good, he's not lying. He wasn't only speaking about some things he made. Now, does this mean that God created every single variation of cat and dog and cow. It means that he created them according to their kinds. So God created the various species that exist on the earth along with all of the potential for adaptation that we now see as we have come thousands of years away from the creation of the world. Yes, Mary. So, so him, so what, what this is saying is basically, like, before he spoke things into existence, like, absolutely nothing existed. Like, not even matter. Like, nothing. Well, nothing that we're told about. Okay. God existed, but God is spirit. Right. Right. Now, what does it mean 
that God called everything good. At the end of every day, and it was good, right? Also, evening and there was morning, that God is establishing not just physical stuff in the creation, God is also establishing the concept of time according to which we live our lives, which is why the whole idea of something being eternal, even before us or after us, is actually kind of scary when you think about it. Because it's like even our favorite thing we like to do, it's like, well, I get tired of that thing eventually. But, you know, not in heaven. You're not going to get tired of heaven. But what does it mean that God called everything that he had made good? Because it was good. It was good in what way? He was satisfied. It was perfect. It was perfect. So it was a moral judgment, but also it was an effective judgment. Because there was no trace of sin, suffering, or death in the world, and... Everything was doing what it was supposed to do. Everything was serving its divinely given purpose, which reminds us that goodness in God's sight is not just holiness of thought and holiness of belief sitting on your hands all day, but to be good in the sight of God means to also be doing the things he wants you to do in faith and love, not just sitting around and thinking correctly about God, right? Let's now continue in Genesis 1. Um, Mary, can you please read verses 26 through 31? Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. How far did I need to go? The 31. Okay. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thank you. Why did God wait till the end to make people? Life sustaining. Yeah, that's actually exactly right. Everything God had done before this was preparing the earth to support human life. So that's perfect. So if that's what you meant when you said life-sustaining, then you got it perfectly. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it mean that God created people in his own image? Does it mean that they looked like God in the same way that Robert looks like me? If he does, supposedly. Someone said yesterday he looks like Marta, which is a falsehood. But what does it mean to be to bear God's image? Especially compared to the way in which God made the other creatures of the earth. Because we are not told that God made the, the fish and the birds and the critters on the land. We're not told that he made them in his own image. We're only told this regarding people. Is, is he talking about Jesus? Oh, he's talking about people like you. Well, I mean, people uh, looking like sure. Jesus. Huh? God in his image. Um, well, but to bear the image of God is not a physical thing. It is an intellectual and spiritual thing. Because God has given people an eternal soul. We see this pictured in chapter 2, which zooms in more specifically on some of the things that we are told about in passing in chapter 1. That God breathed life into Adam. As opposed to just saying, let there be a man. So God has given you a soul. He has given you the capability to know him and believe in him and love him, but also to have a relationship with him in which you are morally accountable. Because animals can't sin. People can sin. Sometimes animals might do things which would give the impression of sin. The easiest example is when an animal kills another animal or bites a person, or does something which we would say is evil. 
But even then, an animal is only operating on the basis of his urges and instincts in a way that has been influenced by the fall into sin, which we and our ancestors have imposed onto the earth. But people can sin. People are the ones whom God has called to believe in him and have a peaceful, loving relationship with him. Now, can the image of God be completely lost? What do you think? By each person, you mean? Yeah. I would say so if they reject him. Well, can the image of God be lost during this life? Oh, no. Yeah. It can be marred and distorted by sin. Because when we came into the world, we did not enter into the world as God's forgiven children and members of his church. God had to bring us into his church and bring us into his family of faith by washing away our sins and making ours the reconciliation that Jesus won for us on the cross through baptism and faith. So we have to be restored to the image of God. So that when now God looks at us through faith, and he sees the righteousness of Christ that we wear by faith, in God's sight, we actually look like the kind of person who would have been walking around in the Garden of Eden. That's not how we feel like right now. This world, especially in 2020, doesn't feel very Eden-y. But that is the effect of God's declaration that we are justified. It is just as much of a miracle from his word that affects reality as when he brought the earth into existence by speaking it into existence. And now what did God tell people to do here after he made them? What were some of the things he said? What was Mon Marta? Uh, be fruitful, multiply. I knew you were going to say that. Like, be in charge of the earth. Yeah, so God said to be fruitful and multiply. In other words, have kids. Be productive in the earth. I don't want you to be the only two people. I want there to be more people like you to whom I give you through you. And then what else did you say since you're on a roll? I don't have a Bible, but like watch over the animals. I'm yeah, the so, so God made them in charge yeah. of the earth. Now, does this mean that Adam and Eve were then allowed in God's sight to do whatever they wanted with the world because possession is nine-tenths of the law? No. They needed to understand, just as we need to understand, that they were caretakers of that which really belonged to God. I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago on Trinity, whatever it was. It's the Sunday of the church year where we focus on the stewardship of the wealth God has given to us. Is that we understand that everything we possess really is God's, and he has just given it to us to handle for a time. And so, that, and so we do that in a way which is... God pleasing and serves his purposes and serves the needs of our neighbor as opposed to viewing our wealth and our other possessions as something that we use only to take care of number one, right? So I know what my question is, but I'm really going to fumble it. So God t told them before the fall to be fruitful and multiply. Is there a reason that they did not do that until after the fall? Like, were they unable to multiply? You don't know how much time there was between the creation and the fall. It was but we're only told of them multiplying after the fall. Which means that it didn't happen before the fall. Because if Adam and Eve would have had a kid or two before the fall into sin, which would have taken a while, by the way, then, because just... They were people. The gestation age for Eve before the fall was not shorter than it is for Marta after the fall. Right, so it would have taken nine months. They didn't have any kids before the fall into sin. That's the answer to the question. Right, but is that because they couldn't? No. Marriage and family and procreation is not a reaction to sin. It is something which God has given to us before the fall into sin. It is a holy estate. It is not a necessary evil, as some people have said in the history of the Christian church. 
This was one of the errors taught by the Roman Catholic Church against which Martin Luther objected. The idea that those who are celibate and do not marry are living a more God-pleasing, Eden-like life, you could say. So we can say with certainty, though, that Adam and Eve did not conceive or bear any children after this command was given before the fall into sin. But we're not given a glimpse into how much time elapsed between these words and the fall. Yes, Marta? Well, in my mind, it's really short. Well, we do, we do assume that, but we just don't know. We're not told how long it was. Audrey? Yeah. Well, even on uh, uh, 22 verse, um, he was talking about the birds, and he said, um, he blessed them and saying, be fruitful and multiply fill the waters of the sea and let the birds multiply on the earth. So he's telling them to multiply. Yeah, God wanted everything to be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not unique to people. It's just that when animals multiply, they're not passing on um, sin. And they're, they're reproducing their own kind. Yeah. Now, before we're done, let us at least get into a bit of chapter 2. Um, Audrey, can you read chapter 2, verses 1 through 3? Do you have your Bible open still? Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because... On it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Did God get tired? No. Do we get tired? Yes. So yes. God, God did not rest in the sense that he was worn out from what was objectively a lot of work over the course of six days. God simply stopped doing that work. And he established the day of rest not for himself, but for for us, because God knows that physically every single creature he has made, human or animal, needs to not work constantly. And God also knows that spiritually we need a day of rest. We need to be able to set a time in our lives, set a part time in our lives to read and hear God's word and be renewed in his grace, renewed in the knowledge of what he has done for us and to be renewed in his forgiveness. God knew these things, and he knew what we would need even before the fall into sin. So the day of rest isn't for God, it's for us. Kind of like how everything else God made in the creation is not for God, it is for us. Now one last thing. Denise, can you please read two verses four, to seven, four through seven? Thank you. And then also read verses 19 and following. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. And you can stop there. 
So this is not how our weddings look nowadays, but this was their wedding. Did God forget to make the woman, or was he making a point? He was making a point. He was teaching Adam, and by connection, he was teaching all men since Adam that they are not meant to be alone, but that they need a woman in their lives, because that is the purpose for which God has made both genders. So it's the man who needs a helper. Well, women need men too, but in, in this account, God was making the point to Adam. Now, does the order of creation imply a sort of strata of bearing the image of God? No, it does not. Because bearing the image of God is not a boy thing or a girl thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a soul thing. It's a knowing and loving and believing in God thing. So that's where we're going to stop for today. We'll pick up next time with the fall. Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God, we pray you to increase in our hearts trust in your word, trust in what you have done for us in history, and trust for what you have promised to do for us now and in the future for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray you also to guide us to be good stewards of what you have made and handed over to us, so that when we pass it on to those whom you send after us, it may be good and life-sustaining for them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.